This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our supporters at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is, without apology, The Abortion Struggle Now by Jenny Brown. With an anti-abortion majority on the Supreme Court and several states attempting to outlaw abortion altogether, many activists are on the defensive, hoping to hold on to reproductive rights in a few places and cases. This spirited book shows how feminism can start winning again. Jenny Brown uncovers a century of legal abortion in the United States until 1873, recalls women's experiences in the illegal days, and shows how the women's liberation movement of the 1960s really won abortion rights. She draws inspiration and lessons from the radicals of the Red Stockings, the Army of Three, and the Jane Collective, putting together a roadmap for today's organizers from the black feminist argument for reproductive justice, the successful fight to make the morning after pill available over the counter, and the recent mass movement to repeal Ireland's abortion ban. Brown argues that politically conservative nonprofits have been setting the agenda, emphasizing rare tragic cases and relying on the rhetoric of choice and privacy. Instead, it is time to return to the fundamental ideas that won legal abortion in the first place. Women publicly telling the full truth of their own experience, demanding repeal of all abortion restrictions, and showing how abortion and birth control are the key demands in the struggle for women's freedom. Without Apology, The Abortion Struggle Now by Jenny Brown. Out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. Hurricane Maria suddenly made Puerto Rico visible to many in the United States. In the wake of the storm, some expressed their empathy in the language of national community. That we should care about the plight of Puerto Ricans because, and hey, you might not know this, they are our fellow American citizens. But however well-intentioned, that inclusive rhetoric obscured a reality and history of colonial domination. Puerto Rico was suddenly seen, but its status remained largely invisible. This history and reality is what I'm discussing with today's guest, Yarimar Bonilla, the co-editor, along with past dig guest Marisol Lebron, of Aftershocks of Disaster, Puerto Rico Before and After the Storm, from Haymarket Books. Maria hit a Puerto Rico that has been subject to arbitrary U.S. power since it was seized during the Spanish-American War. In 2016, Congress used that power to formalize Puerto Rico's long-running debt bondage with the passage of the PROMESA law, which created the Financial Oversight and Management Board of Puerto Rico. That board, better known as La Junta, controls Puerto Rico's finances. La Junta has used that control to impose austerity and to make it all too clear that people enjoy no meaningful political or economic freedom under Puerto Rico's status as a so-called free associated state. And so when Maria came, Puerto Ricans had already been hit hard again and again. As the debt burden and austerity asphyxiated the economy, Droves of people, particularly young people, migrated to the United States. Then came the climate change-driven hurricane, which proved so devastating in part because austerity had left the infrastructure crumbling. Then the federal response, slow and piecemeal, which only ratified the pervasive sense that the powers that be had determined that the future lay elsewhere 
away. And that, in turn, fueled yet more migration. As of this summer, Puerto Rico's population had plummeted by 632,000 since 2004. But this summer, the situation began to change. And fast. Puerto Ricans everywhere insisted on reclaiming the right to determine their own future. And a mass movement exploded that threw Governor Ricardo Rosselló out of office. It was anger that had been pent up over nearly two years of a recovery throughout which Puerto Ricans had to depend on one another because the colonial state had left them homeless and to die. That experience exposed the colonial state for what it was, and it also taught people valuable lessons about their own collective power. What happens next is unclear. I discuss at some length with Yarimar the debate over what decolonizing Puerto Rico might look like. As Eram Getacho recently explained on the show, formal independence in a neocolonial world system delivers no real economic freedom and extremely limited political freedom. On the other hand, Yarimar argues that the condition of racialized others within the United States demonstrates that statehood is far from a panacea. What's clear is that the status quo has lost its legitimacy, and that Puerto Ricans are actively debating a future that is more wide open than it has been in a long time. Before we get this started, this podcast, which I put a ton of time into, as you can probably tell, is overwhelmingly a listener-supported podcast, which means that we only very truly exist because listeners like you support us at patreon.com slash the dig. Plus, we have left-wing books to send you in the mail as a token of our gratitude if you donate at least $10 a month. So, if you haven't done so yet, and you depend on this podcast for your analysis, please know that we depend on you, our listeners, for your support. Contribute what you can at patreon.com slash the dig. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Okay, here's Yarimar Bonilla a professor in the Department of Africana, Puerto Rican, and Latino Studies at Hunter College, and the Ph.D. program in Anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She is the author of Non-Sovereign Futures, French Caribbean Politics in the Wake of Disenchantment, and co-editor of the book we are talking about today, Aftershocks of Disaster, Puerto Rico Before and After the Storm, from Haymarket Books. Yari Marbonia, welcome to The Dig. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So much has happened in Puerto Rico since Hurricane Maria that it's hard to know the best place to begin. But I guess we should start with what's happening right now. What was interesting for me preparing for this interview is that many contributors to your book were taking stock of how these repeated traumas had knocked the political and social wind out of Puerto Rico. Benjamin Torres Gotay wrote about a widespread attitude of resignation, this idea that it could be worse. And you and Marisol Lebron write, quote, Maria is not just about economic exploitation and social inequalities, but also about a deepening crisis of imagination. In the face of immediate matters of life and death, it can be difficult to think beyond the current political binds toward new collective possibilities. But just a few months after publication, a mass movement overthrew Governor Ricardo Rosselló and made, and made Puerto Rico's future suddenly seem radically open and uncertain. To start out, looking back, what sort of political consciousness and social bonds were taking shape beneath what perhaps looked like and and very much was fatalistic resignation? And, And how and why did this submerged politics emerge so powerfully as mass politics when they did? 
Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question. Well, the the truth is that immediately after Hurricane Maria passed, I had gotten funding from the National Science Foundation to do this rapid research to see the political impact of the hurricane. And I had proposed that I wanted to look at how the hurricane might jostle people's previously existing political ideologies and scripts. And so then for two years after that, I was very frustrated because it didn't appear like like anything was happening politically. And so, in fact, uh, before the storm, most of my writings were centered around thinking about uh, how to construct a politics out of pessimism and how and uh, in a moment where things only seem to be getting worse. And this, you know, related to not just the problems of hurricane recovery, but also the broader problems of climate change change, etc. But so so as but even as I was writing this, what I did see taking place throughout Puerto Rico were the kind of small scale initiatives that you know are described in the last section of the book, where activists had come together to think about small scale things like uh, solar power, community kitchens, how to you know repair roofs, how to deal with FEMA, all of these things that didn't look like a mass movement or a national movement and that were, in fact, occurring on, on a very local scale, sometimes at the level of municipalities, but sometimes at the level of, you know, just neighborhood communities. And outside of, of the collection and in my other writings, I was thinking about what this kind of forced resilience meant. Um, and I was uh, concerned that it, in some ways it looked like the kind of neoliberal resilience that was, has been imposed on populations, you know, ra particularly racialized populations populations throughout the world where in the absent in, in the face of a retrenched state and in the face of, of absent state services locals step in and they're the ones that become the first responders aid their communities etc and so I was concerned about how this let the state off the hook and in the case of Puerto Rico how while communities were you know taking charge of their own recovery the state was invested in wooing foreign investment investors in bringing uh, cryptocurrency devotees or blockchain advocates and and also wealthy uh, self-declared expats who wanted to, you know, see, who saw in Puerto Rico a, a kind of blank slate for innovation as they describe it. And so I was really concerned about what the, the political and economic impact of all this forced resilience was going to be, but I am happily surprised to see that all this resilience has really backfired on the state. And in my writing about it, I was already am ambiguous about what or ambivalent, I should say, about what to say about it. Because on the one hand, I was really concerned about its kind of neoliberal consequences. But at the same time, I saw that for those involved in these projects, it was seen as a kind of search for sovereignty, as a kind of decolonial resilience that sought to empower communities in the face of centuries of being told that they couldn't fend for themselves, that they were colonial subjects to either Spain or then the United States. So I saw that at the affective level, it was having a kind of political impact in terms of how people were thinking about sovereignty and autonomy. But I was worried about how the state was benefiting from that. But so then in the, I think in the protest this summer, a lot of the folks that I interviewed, it became clear that those experiences of resilience and of what is locally referred to as autogestión really emboldened folks to uh, not be afraid of getting rid of their government because they didn't see the government as the primary site of care. And so I, I think it, you know, it took a lot for Puerto Rico to not be afraid of asking this their governor to resign without a clear sense of who would take up his seat of power, what would come next. And so that is a very kind of bold step into the unknown that I don't think would have happened without this experience of Maria, of having to uh, fend for yourself and, and, and to think that the government, in some ways, it doesn't really matter who sits in the head of government. That's fascinating because people didn't do this so much out of some ideological commitment to mutual aid, but because the state had just abandoned 
them. But then at the same time, this popular self-organization of, of hurricane relief in, in retrospect was a dress rehearsal of sorts, however unconscious, for, for this mass self-organized politics that emerged. Is it fair to say that this was an experience that simultaneously did two somewhat opposite but complementary things, both teaching people their own power, but also at the same time making it all too clear that the state had abandoned them and that 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 abandonment was intolerable? Yeah, I think it served a double role, maybe not in precisely that way, but in the sense that it showed people's capacity and it also revealed the weakness of the local state. And it's important to not just uh, examine Maria on its own terms, but to place it within the context of the debt crisis. And so already before Maria the capacities of the local state were very much in question uh, with the imposition of the fiscal board. In fact, in the 2016 elections, you know, a lot of people had joked, why are we even electing a governor when we have this, you know, form of colonial rule? Like, we don't have self-government. And so I think that, you know, that had already contributed to that idea. And also the bankrupt nature of the local state, you know, where it had already declared that what was to come was austerity measures, the repealing of services. Um, the, the locals had already been told long before Maria that they had to fend for themselves. And a lot of these forms of community care that emerged after the storm were the product of, of already existing uh, forms of autogestion, uh, solidarity kitchens that had emerged. Um, and, and, and also, you know, even before the debt crisis, decades and decades of anti colonial activism and leftist organizing. So you have organizations like Casa Pueblo that, you know, mobilized in, in the wake of Maria to to create solar powered oases for, you know, the surrounding communities to come and plug in and power their, you know, respiratory machines and, and, and you know, use the, the electricity that they needed for life saving equipment. Their initiatives didn't emerge out of nowhere. They were already solar powered and they had already been working on environmental issues and had, you know, struggled to keep mining companies and and other, you know, environmentally destructive agents from taking over in the in the southern area of Puerto Rico. So you have those kind of long-term activists and activists that had emerged in the wake of the debt crisis and then people who were mobilized in the face of the the specific, you know, failures of FEMA, the federal government, and the local government that was completely MIA in the wake of the storm. So it's, you know, these these different layered forms of community activism that took shape during this period. And so I think the kind of it was a double process of individuals becoming emboldened while at the same time uh, really questioning the role and the strength of a colonial state. But I think that perhaps because that state was seen as in some ways almost irrelevant in the face of of a federal you know, oversight power, people perhaps would not have taken that as their side of action were it not for the transcripts that were released of of the chats among the governor and his advisors where it showed that not only were they kind of useless and and really only concerned with their <laughs> image but on top of that they were you know they 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 showed no no interest in helping Puerto Ricans and were actually in some ways making fun of them, making making light of the dead and making light of these issues that communities had had to take upon themselves to remedy. I want to step back to give some big picture context and then make our way back to the present. But first, now I'd like to, to walk through some of the basic contours of Puerto Rican history since the U.S. seized it as a colony. So, so first to start out, what has the changing role of Puerto Rico within the U.S. system been from the time of its seizure in the Spanish-American War? Is it raw economic exploitation, expropriation and dispossession? Is it is it geopolitical and military power? Is it sort of a path dependency or relationship that's taken on a life of its own or, or some mix of all of the above? In other words, has there been a coherent U.S. imperial strategy or is this something that's been rife with contradictions? It's interesting. I feel like after Hurricane Maria, a lot of people in the United States 
discovered or, or, or for the first time were forced to reckon with the fact that the United States has colonies because the U.S. is not usually imagined as an empire. And when, you know, when it's thought of as acting in an imperial manner, that's imagined more as a kind of foreign intervention into other sovereign countries, not as actually managing and, you know, having direct control over you know, other populations. And that's not coincidental because the fact is that there's been a structural silencing of U.S. empire and of precisely what is its interest in having these territories that from the very beginning of their, you know, uh, uh, acquiring them, these territories were placed on a path of unincorporation. So most territories in the United States, um, when they were acquired, they were, they became incorporated territories, which meant that they were on the path to statehood. But Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Samoa, Guam, these territories were always imagined as too culturally different and as inhabited by, quote, alien races that could not assimilate into the United States. And so they were always placed on a separate track of unincorporation and it was they were never imagined to be on a path of of to statehood or to full annexation or full citizenship and so i think that's something that you know folks in the u.s have to really reckon with the fact that the united states is an empire that is comprised of not just citizens but also uh, non-citizens non-consensual citizens nationals and folks with a, a whole series of stratified forms of inclusion. The way these populations are managed is not unrelated to how within the, the 50 states, Native American populations are managed and also racialized minorities who have been extended the promises of citizenship, but that the, that has always been a kind of unfulfilled promise of full inclusion. And so in thinking about the U.S., we must examine it as a racial imperial formation, right? That is built on foundational structures of inequality, even as it professes to be the land of the free, the home of the brave, you know, an experiment in democracy, all these things, right? And so how how all that freedom was built around a foundational unfreedom. Now, a, a common question I get asked is, why does the U.S. have these territories? Because I think that when these societies are brought into mainstream public consciousness, they're imagined as a sites of welfare and of kind of ben imperial benevolence on the part of the United States. And so we see this most clearly in Trump, though I always, you know, remind folks that the beauty of Trump is that he says the quiet parts out loud. And <laughs> it's, it's not so much that he is, you know, has a, a different view of the United States, but rather makes, you know, all these inequalities really explicit and, um, you know, doubles down on them. So, you know, Trump made it very clear after Hurricane Maria that Puerto Ricans were seen as a tax on the federal budget. And, um, you know, when he showed up, the first thing he did was to chastise Puerto Ricans for throwing his budget out of whack with this natural disaster. So there's this constant image of Puerto Ricans as a drain on federal resources. But the fact is that territories like Puerto Rico, you know, and, and I wrote about this in a in the Washington Post immediately after the hurricane went where, where I examined who was going to benefit from hurricane recovery. Immediately, I knew that this would be the case, that most of the money that would flow into Puerto Rico and that would be represented as a or charity or welfare payments would flow straight back to U.S. contractors because Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands and all these territories are protected markets for foreign companies and, uh, you know, kind of captive audiences for often second rate uh, commercial goods. And so most of the money that flows into these territories, be it through federal transfers for Pell Grants and education or Medicare, you know, coverage or uh, FEMA payments flow right back into the United States. They don't flow outwards to other Caribbean societies because Puerto Rico is unable to have trading uh, trade agreements with their neighbors. It's very difficult for them to flow into kind of local small businesses because it's very hard for local businesses to compete with companies like Walmart and Walgreens. You know, Puerto Rico has the largest number of Walmart and Walgreens um, 
per square foot in the world. <laughs> and, and that often Yikes. surprises people. So there's a definite kind of financial interest. But, you know, th th that's not the full extent of it. Obviously, there was for a long time an important geopolitical interest in maintaining military bases in the Caribbean, close to Cuba, close to the Panama Canal. But a lot of those military bases have now closed, some of them due to social movements, as in the island of Vieques, where locals fought to get you know, rid of the experimental warfare and environmental damage that those military bases were causing. They'd basically turned the island's beach into a bombing range. Yeah, they squeezed the, in the island of Vieques, they squeezed the local population into a tiny part of the island. Island, and most of it, which is, a, a, you know, a, a gorgeous, you know, landscape of natural beauty, you know, is now uh, deceptively, uh, you know, covered in contamination and in hidden uh, bombs that have not been cleaned up. And that, you know, that's a different story. But there's a lot of controversy about how the military withdrew without properly cleaning up that site or doing any kind of real demilitarization in the sense of fixing uh, an atrophied society and economy that had been geared around military interest. So you have these kind of economic interests, you have geopolitical interests, military interests, but for a long time also, Puerto Rico was a site of experimentation. So things that were not allowed to happen in the U.S. territories could happen there. There was experimentation with warfare, as I said in the case of Vieques, where different chemical agents were released, etc. There was experiments in population control, uh, where women were sterilized en masse. Birth control pills were developed there. There were different kinds of experiments that are not entirely different from the kind of racial racialized medical experimentation that also happened within the 50 states among racialized communities. And so you, you have those forms of experimentation. And, you know, many think that at present there's a kind of economic ex and neoliberal experimentation that is taking place in Puerto Rico where this fiscal control board is really pushing to the limits to see how much austerity a society can withstand. And so all of this, uh, you know, named resilience and the call for people to reinvent themselves themselves and to fend for themselves is is really a, a, a way in seeing, you know, a way to see how much can you continue to tax local populations because Puerto Rico has the highest sales tax in all of the United States while completely limiting the kind of public services that a state offers to its residents. Puerto Rico became an Estado Libre Asociado, what's often called Commonwealth in English, but that literally translates as free associated state. In 1952, Puerto Rico then used tax breaks to industrialize, which at the time created a sense that, that Puerto Rico's relationship to the U.S. had made it an island of prosperity in an otherwise poor Caribbean, a, a counterpoint perhaps to the model of the Cuban Revolution. But as you've said, quote, for many, the economic crisis represented the end of the mirage of prosperity that the ELA represented. So in the 1950s, Puerto Ricans were, you know, were told that they had been decolonized and that they were on the path to a prosperous post-colonial future led by, you know, the, the kind of development, modern, modern industrial initiatives of the ELA state. So it, this meant to some extent the move from an agricultural base to more of a manufacturing base and, and an industrial economy. But it also depended greatly on uh, migration of a good, you know, large numbers of agricultural workers who then went off to work in, who, who went off to work in factories in in the United States. And so there was a dismantling of the agricultural economy and the appearance of a new economy built on manufacturing. But really what 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 it was built on was on uh, you know the extension of tax breaks to pharmaceuticals and other industries, which happen to be uh, you know industries that are very hazardous to the environment as, as, as well is something that we're only just now really getting a sense of. But so these companies came in and they were supposed to create jobs, but really they were not high paying jobs. They were low paying jobs. And part of what they did was to create an artificial sense of prosperity and a kind of facade of development. In the 1990s, these tax breaks for these companies begin to be phased out. And you see a mass exodus as, you know, these 
corporations and industries move to places with lower wages. And so it's at that point, it starts to become clear that Puerto Rico really has no economic base of its own other than to serve as a site of cheap labor and as a site of, of federal exemption. And so it's at this point that the government begins to borrow very heavily with the aid of Wall Street, specifically uh, Lehman Brothers, that which helps the government come up with these new ways of packaging its debt and imposing new forms of taxation on locals to ensure these debts that, that were really unpayable. So these debt schemes, along with the lack of an economic base, lead, you know, slowly but surely to the economic crisis that is then declared on top of the global crisis of 2008. Puerto Rico experiences a kind of double crisis. And as the rest of the world kind of pulled out of that, at least, you know, for for some sectors, Puerto Rico's crisis only worsened. Just as like Puerto Rico's colonial particularity is used to industrialize it in a way that's not sustainable and then leads to economic crisis, its colonial peculiarity is then exploited again to sell these special tax-exempt bonds, which make taking on massive amounts of debt an attractive way to paper over the fundamental economic crisis. Well, it worked really great for Wall Street uh, because Puerto Rico was able to issue triple tax exempt bonds, which were just uh, irresistible to investors because it was one, you know, the only place where you would you didn't have to pay taxes on your investments to your local state, to the federal state or to the local society in which you were investing. And so that's part of what, you know, led to Puerto Rico's uh, debt crisis. You know, a lot of people point to the kind of insatiable need to borrow on the part of the local uh, government. But there was also an insatiable need to create, you know, greater and better profits on the part of uh, Wall Street. So um, that was uh, fundamental to, you know, it's the situation that is in now. And part of why many folks want Puerto Rico's debt to be audited, because they think that it was actually uh, odious debt and and anti-constitutional. Uh, because Puerto Rico, you know, in its constitution, it's, you know, its ability to borrow is supposed to be limited to its ability to pay it back. But there were way- ways that were created of circumventing um, those limits for the interests of Wall Street. And there's also the issue of how Puerto Rico sh- should have been barred from borrowing, but instead, you know, incredible interest rates were imposed on its debt, which made it even more lucrative and attractive for the folks who were you know, investing in it up until the very end. And it's, you know, it's disturbing to note, but important to note that after Maria, the price of Puerto Rican bonds soared because a lot of folks thought that maybe now with the, you know, arrival of some federal aid, that money would go not towards rebuilding, but to repaying the debt. There's a Frente Ciudadano por la Auditoría de la Deuda, the Citizens Front for an Audit of the Debt, which is an alliance fighting for a forensic audit of the debt, which was created after Governor Rosselló disbanded an official commission for the comprehensive audit of Puerto Rico's debt. How have the politics of debt played out in in recent years on the island? And how might Puerto Rican movements overthrow a junta over which they by law have no control? One thing that's interesting about the, you know, Puerto Ricans relationship to the debt and to the fiscal board is that it has actually not been consistent. Um, and there, we've seen shifts in, in local attitudes towards it. The fact is that in the beginning, when Puerto Rico's debt crisis was declared, folks were calling for federal assistance. But what they imagined was something more like a kind of a federal intervention into maybe eliminating some of the debt, maybe the federal reserve taking charge over some of it, um, some kind of, if, if not bailout, at the very least assistance, or even just the ability for the local government to declare bankruptcy, which was not allowed to do. But instead, what the federal government did was to appoint this fiscal oversight board. And again, at first, people thought, oh, oversight, that sounds good. And, and a lot of folks thought that what the board would do would be precisely to audit the debt and to hold people accountable 
accountable who had engaged in illegal practices. I, you know, I was interviewing people at the time who were very excited about the arrival of the oversight board because, you know, as one woman said, they're going to have to, you know, bring in the public buses and fill them to take people to jail. So they, they, <laughs> they, they thought that this was going to be a site of um, dealing with corruption, mismanagement, looking into shady contracts, etc. So that was the expectation. And instead, you know, Puerto Ricans were shocked to, to see that the folks that were appointed to the board, you know, which was later found to be a, a possibly unconstitutional process because they were appointed without any hearings and without any investigation into their possible conflicts of interest. Many of them had been involved in the creation of the debt to begin with and had actually benefited from it because they were, you know, they were in, involved in insurance industries, etc., banking industries that benefited greatly from Puerto Rico's debt. So first of all, it became clear that this was not going to be the kind of oversight and kind of uh, accountability board that that local citizens wanted. Second, the the whole the bill for this board is footed entirely by the Puerto Rican government, and so it said that you know the folks who serve on it they're doing pro bono work, and ridiculously some of them have been given awards for their you know work in the public interest for serving on this uh, oversight board. But the board is incredibly expensive because it spends millions of dollars on consultants, on uh, uh, lawyers. And, and one of the politicians who was involved in advocating for the creation of the board, Pedro Pierluisi, who came back into the spotlight when he tried to declare himself governor after Ricardo Rosselló stepped down, um, he advocated for the creation of the board and is now working at some of the law firms that are making the most money. Money from their contracts with the board. So at present, uh, among the Democratic Party, there, within the Democratic Party, I should say, there is, you know, an interest in reviewing what exactly, you know, this PROMESA law that, you know, allowed for the creation of the fiscal board, what exactly it entails, whether there are ways of improving it. I've heard the phrase of democratizing PROMESA, which to me is a kind of oxymoron because I'm not sure how you democratize a colony. It's kind of inherently anti-democratic unless perhaps they, they allow people to elect, you know, the members of the fiscal board. There's also been talk of the federal government footing the bill for the fiscal board and, and of starting to consider the members of the fiscal board as federal employees or federal agents, I suppose, uh, since they don't get paid salaries, um, rather than as local agents. That is really interesting because it would put an end to a lot of the exceptionality that allows the board to operate. It would mean that there would be caps on salaries. So, you know, if someone like Natalie Jaresco is considered a federal employee, there would be a cap placed on her exorbitant salary, which includes, you know, paid trips to Ukraine to visit her family, etc. So that would put an, an end to a lot of the mismanagement of the board. It would re also require all the members to submit themselves to hearings and investigations into their conflicts of interest. And so there is heavy lobbying on behalf of, of the board and its supporters to ensure that that doesn't happen and that it remains a territory board, um, which is a euphemism, you know, for a colonial board. It seems like part of what you're spelling out from this initial period when polls did show what in retrospect is a surprisingly high approval rating for the junta amongst Puerto Ricans to, you know, people chanting for both Rosselló and the junta to go this summer is a coming to consciousness that the corruption isn't a local Puerto Rican problem, as it's still often portrayed, I think, in the U.S., this sort of like tropical malaise, but rather that the corruption is something systematic and fundamental to the larger political, economic and colonial system. Yes, well, ab absolutely. That was really present in people's minds and partly because right before the scandal with the governor, there had been a series of FBI arrests and the arrests were not of local citizens um, or, you know, or I should say of Puerto Ricans, um, but they Julia were... Julia Kelleher. Yeah, famously the poster child of, you know, of controversy over, you know, federal uh, presence in Puerto Rico, 
Julia Kelleher, who had been brought in and, and was someone else who was paid an exorbitant salary on the premise that, you know, we had to bring the best and the brightest to Puerto Rico and pay them, you know, what locals, you know, beyond what locals needed to be paid in order to fix all our problems. It turned out that she was at the center of a corruption scandal. And there were also um, folks in... And she was arrested and charged in July, just before the protest kickoff. Yes, kickoff. she was arrested and charged. I'm still still uh, not tried, but um, this was for some. This was a dream come true because many had been pointing to all her mismanagement of the education department, and she claimed um, that she had already stepped down, uh, presumably because she knew these arrests were coming, and she had claimed that she had done her job, that she was a quote unquote change agent, and that she had come to you know bring charter schools, close uh, public schools, and reorient the educational system towards um, a for-profit system that leaves many behind. So that, you know, I think that that really, you know, gave evidence to what many already suspected. And in, in, in addition to those initial arrests, there were later a, another series of a, arrests of FEMA officials from the United States who were the ones that were mismanaging funds as well. And, you know, we had also already seen the corruptions with uh, what the Whitefish scandal, Cobra scandal, these other U.S. contractors um, that come in. And, and you know, Whitefish is the Montana company that I like only had something like a handful of employees when they were given this massive recovery contract to repair the electrical grid, if I remember correctly. Yes, which which was was very uh, was obtained in a very questionable manner, supposedly via a LinkedIn uh, exchange, which <laughs> makes no sense. Um, uh, yeah, I, lo- I love that. I mean, like, I, I, it, it makes me want to maybe actually open up some of those LinkedIn emails that I constantly get. But, but um, yeah, so so I think there was already was already very clear that, uh, you know, corruption was in no way endemic to Puerto Rico, although, you know, some might say that it is endemic to the colony. There is this uh, g- group of artists that do these murals and public art in Puerto Rico. And there's one above the expressway where the know that that is the kind of a billboard of sort that they change constantly and at one point they said um todo se pudre en el vagón de la colonia everything rots in in the kind of shipping container of the colony and so this was an invocation of all the like abandoned shipping containers with aid and also a reference to the bodies the maria's you know dead bodies that had piled up and were in also shipping containers so there's a sense that you know the colony it's not puerto ricans that are rotten or, or corrupt but actually the colony which is a fundamental you know site of corruption experimentation exceptionality um loopholes all of these things and so you know it, it's no surprise then that you would find all this mismanagement and profiteering happening here that really reminds me a lot of how the demonization of of poor majority black u.s cities as corrupt or inept is used to impose these state takeovers, which obviously takes away, you know, democratic control from local populations. But maybe even more importantly, what it does on the political ideological level is obscures this the actual larger reality of dispossession and segregation and exploitation that have created the the conditions that that conservative state leaders then blame on those same people. Absolutely. And, you know, interestingly, in the state of Michigan, there was a lawsuit uh, brought against the government that found the role of these emergency managers to be discriminatory, because if you were African-American, you had a disproportionate chance of living in a you know county or municipality under emergency management, which meant that you had a disproportionate chance of experiencing something like the Flint water crisis. You know, so, uh, you know, what populations are brought under emergency rule, exceptional rule and, you know, deprived of services in the name of such a supposed financial emergency, you know, that 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 is the very race to process. And it's a performance of blame, of holding basically the, the dominated responsible for the actions of the dominators. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's infused with racial colonial logics. As you just mentioned, the dismantling of public education was a major priority for Governor Rosselló and uh, now federally charged 
former Secretary of, of Education, Julia Kelleher. It's also been a huge priority for the Junta. And they have imposed massive cuts to the Universidad de Puerto Rico, which is not only the, the center of higher education in Puerto Rico, but also CORTA, its entire social fabric. All in all, the Junta approved fiscal plan calls for cuts that by 2022 will total 56% of traditional funding levels. According to an article I read recently uh, from the summer, I think, in the in Inside Higher Ed, which is a total cut of more than $500 million annually below traditional funding levels. That, unsurprisingly, has led to an increase in tuition and the casualization of academic labor. In your book, Rima Brusi and Isar Godru write that UPR has been a center of political resistance in Puerto Rico and that, quote, weakening UPR and its potential for resistance would no doubt favor a government body intent on slashing public resources. What's your overall analysis of the Junta's austerity agenda, how it's played out, and why it is focused on education in particular? <sighs> this, this, you know, this touches me uh, on a kind of core level in many ways uh, as a product of public education in Puerto Rico and of, of the university system there. And I think, you know, it, it is very disturbing how this became the first site of action, particularly since uh, the university system was not the site of the most troubling debt or or mismanagement. You know, you look at something like the uh, power company, you know, that should have been the first site. So we have to ask why this became the first target. And I think many uh, fear that it is about, uh, you know, ensuring that it's not a site of enduring political mobilization. But also, you know, what does it mean for young people to to not have you know a place in which to become productive members of their society in the social movement of the summer a lot of people who were on the streets were on the streets not just to get rid of the governor but to make Puerto Rico a place where they can live and thrive you know and and they feel like their future is being denied that they're being told that Puerto Rico is not a place where they can study where they can you know go to school get a degree you know learn a, a trade or, or you know uh, become a productive member of society and that in order to do that they have to leave. Already before Maria with the debt crisis there was a lot of concern about Puerto Rico losing its young people becoming a, a, a place you know inhabited only by the elderly that are left behind and you know m many elderly uh, found themselves alone and, and, and you know the deaths of Maria were also linked to that abandonment of older people as young people have to leave in order to find living wages and educational opportunities elsewhere. So, you know, there's a real concern that this is about not only ensuring a kind of depoliticized population, and I should note that, you know, before all of this, I was one of the research projects I had was looking at political knowledge in Puerto Rico and the different political knowledge that people have, the, the difference in political knowledge among those who went to the public university versus the private university. And those who, who had gone to the public university had much stronger political knowledge, understanding of po Puerto Rican history, understanding of the colonial relationship, and a more critical stance towards the government. Like, the, this is just clearly documented. And so... Uh, you know, some say, oh, it doesn't matter if we lose the public university because there are private universities to step in. But the, you know, not only is the political knowledge acquired in these private universities much less, their retention rates are much less, their graduation rates are much less. So these are, you know, uh, for profit uh, uh, institutions. And they revolt less often. That there's less protests. Yeah, there's less, yeah. there's less political activity. Yeah. But in, in addition to, to the population being depoliticized in the private universities, they're also de-skilled. Many of them don't graduate. And a lot of these private universities are really just there to, you know, collect the funds of, of Pell Grants and, and you know, of, of student debt and, and are not really graduating students, much less placing them in jobs with living wages. All of this, you know, was already taking place, you know, and where there's a kind of increasing feeling that Puerto 
Rico more and more is becoming a place where it's impossible for young people to live and thrive and where they feel really pushed out and displaced to the United States at the same time that the local government is recruiting self-described expats from the 50 states to come to Puerto Rico and invest and buy up the land that other people are leaving behind. This is Sarah Jaffe, and you are listening to The Dig with Daniel Denver, my favorite podcast for thoughtful discussions on the U.S. left and beyond, and you can support it on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our supporters at Patreon.com and by University of North Carolina Press, which has loads of great titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermined Black Homeownership by Kienga Yamada-Taylor, a frequent guest right here on The Dig. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, a wave of urban uprisings pushed politicians to bring about an end to the practice of redlining. Reasoning that the turbulence could be calmed by turning black city dwellers into homeowners, they passed the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968 and set about establishing policies to induce mortgage lenders in the real estate industry to treat black home buyers equally. What ensued was a bonanza of racist corruption at the expense of black home buyers. The racist exclusion of redlining had been transmuted into a new phenomenon of predatory inclusion. Race for Profit uncovers how exploitative real estate practices continued well after housing discrimination was banned, and new policies meant to encourage low-income homeownership created new methods to exploit black homeowners. By the end of the 1970s, the push to uplift black homeownership had descended into a gold mine for realtors and mortgage lenders, called by Michelle Alexander, a horror story of racial capitalism and longlisted for the National Book Award. Race for Profit reveals how the urban core was transformed into a new frontier of cynical extraction. Race for Profit, how banks in the real estate industry Undermined Black Homeownership by Kianga Yamada Taylor. Out now from University of North Carolina Press. In 2012, one of the things you're referring to here, I think, is this massive tax break that Puerto Rico created exclusively for new arrivals, basically high net worth people from New York, Silicon Valley, wherever. That includes tax exemption from investment income through 2035. And this is specifically available to people, to new arrivals, not to residents and not even to Puerto Rican born people who might want to come back. To me, it seems like there's something settler colonial to this dynamic when taken as a whole, as an effort to remake Puerto Rico's demographics in a way that's maybe somewhat new for the the colonial project, given that you have outsiders being induced to move in at the same time that the social system, as you were just discussing, the social system that enables Puerto Ricans to live in Puerto Rico is being undermined, pushing them out. What, what do you think? Yeah, it's 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 hard to not get too uh, deep into a conspiracy theory about this because it does, <laughs> you know, it does feel like a kind of population swap is uh, one term that has been used. And, you know, it, it reminds me of what the uh, writer and, and, and theorist, a colonial, decolonial thinker, a Cesare described as genocide by substitution, which is the process that he witnessed taking place in the French Caribbean when very similar process of, of, of push and pull factors for Caribbean populations to move to France in the wake of, of Guadeloupe and Martinique becoming overseas departments, while uh, French bureaucrats were brought to the island with the lure of higher salaries than what locals would receive, uh, you know, access to greater capital and, and opportunities. So in Puerto Rico, that hadn't happened the way it had in other parts of the Caribbean, in part because of the language barrier. Whereas in the French Caribbean, 
folks from mainland France would arrive and be able to live and move easily in, Fran in French. In Puerto Rico, it used to be really hard to move around and, and, and live easily without speaking Spanish. Those language politics have changed uh, somewhat, although local activists have always resisted the imposition of English. And we, we shouldn't forget that at one point, the United States wanted to change the name of the island to Puerto Rico with a P-O-R-T-O -P spelling. And, uh, and there was also the imposition of the English language in the schools, the arrival of U.S. school teachers. So there was a moment where a, a, a bit more of a kind of uh, assimilationist project was attempted in Puerto Rico, but this was met with heavy resistance on the part of local activists, especially local school teachers. Hello, here comes the importance of education sector again, <laughs> that had pushed back on these measures and had insisted on on teaching, you know, locals in their native language on still continuing to teach as much as they could, Puerto Rican history, and etc. So uh, it's not coincidental that with the decay of the educational system, uh, which has long been a site of maintaining, uh, you know, linguistic fluency in Spanish, etc. You, you know, you have and with also with the kind of cultural globalization that exists across the globe, where in, in general, not just in U.S. colonies, um, English, you know, is a kind of global language. You have uh, the ability of folks from the United States to be able to arrive in Puerto Rico, conduct business, live in certain enclaves, and be able to make their lives there, even if they're not fluent in Spanish. So, that you know, that combined with the economic incentives that are almost shocking in the in, in their uh in their impact and in and in and you know in what they mean you know and i always they're I massive if they're you massive. had if, if you had that kind of investment income you would be just so stupid not to move to puerto rico basically they're yeah, huge yeah and i've you know i've interviewed some of these folks and and you know many of them are the, you know they themselves are don't, don't fully understand how this is possible and they themselves wonder if at some point you know locals are going to become more resentful of them um but they said well you know the government has created these opportunities for us we would be foolish to not take advantage of them and so they you know and and they they convince themselves that they are giving back to the society by creating jobs, although for many of them, you know, in this kind of digital era where a lot of work is done remotely, you have global freelancers, the the human cloud, as the previous governor liked to refer to, you know, what the, what a lot of these folks are, you know, the jobs they're creating are personal assistants, uh, landscapers, you know, personal chefs. Um, Cleaners. Yeah, they're they're not creating, you know, this is not an industry that is being brought to Puerto Rico. It's really enclaves of wealthy individuals and it is a form of gentrification. And so you have now sites in Puerto Rico uh, like Rincón, uh, Dorado, uh, Palmas del Mar, Vieques. You know, there are these pockets now where you have large uh, English speaking communities um, that that are really changing the cultural fabric of, of Puerto Rico. Returning to something we, we discussed at the top of the interview, you said, quote, the question we need to ask is, what is the relationship between self-reliance and self-determination? And to me, it seems like that that question is such an important one because dependency and independence are so complex. On the one hand, dependency is a critical facet of colonial domination, but, but on the other hand, independence as self-reliance isn't necessarily liberation when it's a euphemism or pretext for austerity and abandonment by the state. How have you seen this dynamic play out since the hurricane in, in terms of its contradictorily reactionary and liberatory potentials? Well, this is something that I was concerned with even before Hurricane Maria, because in looking at Puerto Ricans' desire to move beyond their current political situation, this kind of 
crisis of imagination, as you know, you you referenced in the beginning. You know, part of the problem is the the political options available for post colonial societies. So, right. in you know, and and I you know I argue that that you know a lot of U.S. politicians they say, oh, we support self determination for Puerto Ricans and whatever they want, we will give them, which is, I I think is really a, a disingenuous kind of statement. And you know, we see this from politicians across the spectrum from, you know, Republicans to very recently Bernie Sanders making the exact same statement. So what we, I think what we need from U.S. politicians is to, to speak to us more clearly about what are the contemporary U.S. interests in holding on to its colonial territories? What does the U.S. gain from having these colonial sites? Because it is clear to most Puerto Ricans that we would not be in the political relationship that we are in with the United States if it did not benefit the U.S. So I think that from the side of, of U.S. politicians, what we need is not this kind of a vague declaration that they will be beholden to whatever, you know, Puerto Ricans say and that they support self-determination, but rather a kind of more clear transparency on what the role of empire of, in, of the U.S., what the role of these territories has been historically in the U.S. economy and what it is today and what, you know, what the U.S. is willing, how the U.S. is willing to shift its imperial economy or not in the name of true decolonization. The other element for locals and, you know, Puerto Rico is not the only society that is a non-sovereign society. In fact, in the Caribbean, as, as I've written elsewhere, the majority of societies are actually non-sovereign. They are departments, protectorates, um, municipalities of of France of the Netherlands you know that there are and also of the United Kingdom so there are a whole series of these uh, non-sovereign political arrangements and you know these uh, the residents of these places are often portrayed as kind of weird aberrations uh, holdovers you know kind of places that miss the boat of decolonization but you know they serve an economic and political purpose to their empires and and the other important thing to think about is that, you know, th these residents, when they look around at the rest of the Caribbean and the rest of the post-colonial world, they they don't see a bright and sunny, you know, kind of picture. Uh, the fact is that decolonization as it took place in the mid uh, 20th century was a process of ensuring that the political and economic relationships of empire would endure. So it was really n not a process that helped former colonies be placed on a path of true self-determination, of true self-reliance, and of, of of true sovereignty. What it offered many of these societies was, you know, is what some of us describe as flag independence. You know, a, an anthem, a coin, a, a flag, representation at the Olympics. You know, which are not uh, insignificant. And Puerto Ricans, they they love the Olympics. <laughs> you know, and and, <laughs> and they love these forms of, of of cultural sovereignty that are you know important. But most independent societies in the Caribbean and beyond in the post-colonial world don't have economic sovereignty, you know, and, and, and their political sovereignty is consistently brought into question through U.S. intervention and, and the intervention of other bodies, such as the United Nations. You know, right now in, in Haiti, there's huge protests that are not just against their local government, but against the U.N. and against what is described as the core group. You know, there, there's this understanding that the legacies of empire persist to this day and that decolonization as it actually existed did not decolonize. So what we also need, aside from U.S. politicians and populations reckoning with the reality of, of U.S. empire and the way it has benefited from its territories, we also need to decolonize decolonization and to reimagine what, the, what that process should look like. In the case of Puerto Rico, how can you imagine something like independence when you have 45% of the population residing in the U.S.? Um, how are you you, how are you going to think about this transnational community and, and, you know, the polity that it belongs to? And, you know, the other thing is that for a lot of Puerto Ricans, you know, the mobility of a U.S. passport is something that they don't want to quickly let go of. But that doesn't mean, you know, that then we should be asserting and reaffirming citizenship as the only 
pathway to mobility. Uh, in fact, you know, the, the kind of discrimination that undocumented populations are, are facing right now in the United States should lead us to question the narratives of citizenship and to question, um, you know, affirmations of citizenship as the only pathway to achieving social justice. So I think, you know, decolonizing decolonization, rethinking citizenship, rethinking, you know, the nation state as the container of our of our populations and of our polities and of, you know, the sites through which we engage politically. I think all of these are necessary for thinking of a collective future, something that is, you know, ever more present in this era of climate crisis, you know, where we have to think beyond borders in order to survive in any case. Yeah, I want to ask you a direct follow-up question about that, which is that if formal independence doesn't suffice, given that neocolonialism can always, as we've seen all over the, the, the global South throughout the 20th century through through today, it, it can always impose and normalize more diffuse forms of economic and geopolitical domination. Given that, I wonder what you think the solution is. You, you write that the statehood movement has, quote, not been analyzed as an anti-colonial option. Does Puerto Rico have the option to pursue through statehood a radical sort of inclusion, the sort of decolonization that Amy Césaire and Leopold Senghor advocated in terms of the democratization of empire? Well, before engaging with the question of whether Puerto Ricans can do what Césaire and Senghor sought to do, we have to keep in mind that Senghor and Césaire failed to do that. So, I, I, yes, there, there are folks who see statehood as a radical option, but we have to keep in mind that that we've never seen that pan out, you know, and that there was this moment and this possibility of of France, and you know, in the case of Césaire and Senghor, to become a post-colonial polity that did not reproduce the hierarchies of empire, but it failed to do so. And so I think that should make us cautious about the political potentials of statehood. However, you know, I I'm an anthropologist. I'm not a policymaker. So I listen to what, you know, to what the people I interview say. And I, I respect and echo, you know, their sentiments. So I know that there are some folks who do think that um, statehood could bring about some kind of political transformation for Puerto Rico and for the United States. Now, one thing that I'm weary of is a lot of, you know, stateside populations or stateside communities that are have begun to advocate for Puerto Rican statehood, thinking that it would be good for the United States in the sense that it might bring democratic votes, that it, you know, that it might lead to a more progressive political representation in U.S. government. Um, and we have to be weary about placing that burden on Puerto Ricans to democratize and decolonize the U.S., right? So that's that's one, one comment I would make. Another comment that I would make is that, um, you know, historically, the way statehood has been imagined from the site of Puerto Rico is, uh, you know, and the way the United States has been imagined by pro-statehood supporters is as something more akin to perhaps the European Union, which would be a federation of sovereign polities. Uh, so in some ways, I think what Puerto Ricans would advocate for is an increased state state sovereignty and greater states rights. And that's something that is not necessarily seen as progressive by a lot right. of folks in right. the United States. So I, you know, I caution people in the United States, many of whom write to me frequently to get to, to you know, <laughs> propose different uh, scenarios where they, they, they think that extending, um, you know, full voting rights and, and uh, you know, turning Puerto Rico into a state as a progressive option, I caution them, you know, on, on what exactly that would mean, you know, and to not make assumptions about what, you know, what a Puerto Rican state would represent. So which which means that, you know, it's perhaps best not to instrumentalize Puerto Rico because it might backfire against you. <laughs> so, um, But what so about then, from the Puerto Rican perspective? Because like you because because like you said, the independence is a bit formal independence as we know from history and from Puerto Rico's neighbors, can be a trap as well. Yeah. From from the Puerto Rican perspectives, some do see it as in this manner. However, some of the folks that I've interviewed, I have, you know, a quote that, you know, in, in an article I've written where this one woman described it as la, la opción menos mala. So like the least worst option, 
<laughs> is that the, the least worst or the least bad option? The, the, so, the, the, yeah, either way. <laughs> yeah. So from a, a, a limited buffet of bad options, you, you said I could curse. So, uh, you know, when I talk oh, yeah. to my friends, I, I, I describe this as a as a buffet of shitty options. <laughs> you know, um, statehood is seen as the kind of you know least worst case scenario obviously that's not something that inspires a lot of emotion and passion <laughs> of like yay let's take let's take you know from that buffet of questionable uh, you know food that's been sitting out for a long time and might have a variety of bacteria let's see the one that's least likely to kill us or something <laughs> right um, so so I think that for some people that's how statehood is imagined as of you know faced with enduring naked colonialism because you know after the declaration of the debt crisis the imposition of, of the fiscal board a series of supreme court cases that were heard where the federal government um, shifted on its position and stated overtly that Puerto Rico does not have self-government these Some are in things. 2016 right yep 2016 yep. so before that the uh, Puerto Rico was supposed to have something akin to self-government. And uh, now it's, you know, naked, clear and transparent that Puerto Rico's sovereignty resides with Congress, that Congress is the only site where changes and, and you know, can be made to Puerto Rico. And that, in fact, Puerto Rico's governor could be removed at any point, you know, and this is something that was actually a, a source of debate uh, this summer. So Puerto Ricans do not have any right of self-government right now. They are a colony. And so that's undesirable for obvious reasons. The kind of independence that the post-war decolonization project created is undesirable because it's an independence that's meant to keep former colonies in a subjugated economic position on the world stage and to continue to allow for imperial intervention of the type that we've seen in places like Haiti or in places like Jamaica, where the U.S. has intervened and extradited, you know, populations in places like Gren Granada, where the U.S. also intervened, you know, so so that is an undesirable, you know, option as well. And so for some folks, statehood appears to be perhaps the least shitty option. However, I think that as more and more Puerto Ricans are moving to the United States in the wake of the debt crisis, in the wake of Maria, increasing even more an already substantial population within the 50 states, they're coming to terms with what it means to be a racialized citizen in the United States and the kind of unfulfilled promises of inclusion for racialized populations and how citizenship in the United States does not guarantee that you won't be discriminated, that you won't be racially profiled, that you won't actually be shot and killed even on the street by uh, the agents of state violence. So it's, it's it's, you know, questionable where that kind of statehood project could lead us. It does seem questionable. And those all do seem like at best insufficient, at worst shitty options. It, but it, it does seem like whatever the, the solution is, and it probably like all things in politics will be a series of provisional solutions that hopefully are heading in in the right directions that given that the Puerto Rican nation and people are, are divided between Puerto Rico itself and the United States and because of just the fundamentally deep relationship of domination between the United States and Puerto Rico, that any true decolonization of, of Puerto Rico will also necessarily do something to decolonize the United States. Not that we should be instrumentalizing it in that way, but one does seem to follow from the other. I, th I think that they're linked. I think the dismantling of U.S. empire is fundamental to Puerto Ricans and to the planet as a whole. You know, uh, yeah. we, we you know, we we have to think about also how colonial and settler logics um, are an integral part of also the relationship to the, the planet and the environment. You know, the idea that you can conquest, control, take over of natural resources, uh, impose yourself and, and not, not not worry about your impact on, on land and populations, you know, is part of what has gotten us into the current moment of, you know, climate change and, and climate emergency. And, and, and in addition, you know, uh, colonial logics that, you know, I always talk about racial, racial colonial logics because I see them completely entangled. So the relationship, the situation of racial 
racialized minorities in the United States of, of native uh, and indigenous communities in the United States are completely entangled with the, you know, the colonial situation as well. The management of these populations has always been thought of in relationship to each other. The insular cases that determined that Puerto Ricans were alien races, they were, you know, thought of in, in direct relationship to Plessy versus Ferguson and the kind of legal precedents that allowed for segregation and Jim Crow policies in the U.S. as well as the precedents that allow that allowed for the creation of Native American reserve lands and and the extension of citizenship to Native American populations in a similar way as it was extended to Puerto Rican populations as a way of co-opting and and creating these non-consensual colonial citizens. So all of this needs to be thought of in relationship to each other and I think a a lot of these communities understand that and and understand instinctively that the way in which they have been racialized, exploited, marginalized, experimented upon works in tandem and in relationship to each other. Um, so I think that all of that connected then as well to our concerns about the planet and to uh, to our concerns about how unrestricted capitalist uh, deployment and, and development is impacting the earth and impacting us all. These are all a kind of complicated, you know, tangle that can't be dealt with kind of separately or placed in some kind of priority order of, you know, well, you know, we can we just have to battle climate change because that's what's most important. Or, you know, we need to confront capitalism head on and then we'll we'll deal with colonialism because, you know, colonialism won't, you know, will we'll carry on, you know, regardless. So I think, you know, these things have to be dealt with together and and their co-constitutive nature has to be better understood. I want to talk about the status question in terms of how it's shaped Puerto Rican politics and how how that's gotten shaken up over in recent months. In NACLA, Pedro Caban writes that this summer's uprising marked a huge crisis for Puerto Rico's two-party system, which is controlled by, on the one hand, the Partido Nuevo Progresista, the New Progressive Party, or PNP, and the Partido Popular Democrático, the Popular Democratic Party, or PPD. The PNP... And obviously, this is for listeners' benefits, not for yours. <laughs> the, the the PNP, the the party of ousted Governor Roseo, is dedicated to to statehood. The PPD is historically dedicated to supporting the now discredited status quo of the free associated state. Meanwhile, the Partido Independista Puertorriqueño, the Puerto Rican Independence Party, has has long been a powerful social movement force, but electorally. Marginal and and Caban argues that quote the uprising exposed the status issue the ideological bedrock of both political parties for what it is a false dichotomy between two political organizations neither of which has the credibility nor the requisite support to motivate Congress to effect a change of Puerto Rico's colonial status. What's your take on this? How how from your perspective? Did the did the junta and hurricane combine to to discredit the status quo? And do you do you agree with Caban that this is finally shaking Puerto Rican politics loose of a two party system that has used the politics of status not to resolve the national question, but more to obscure the more comprehensive political and economic issues facing Puerto Rico, of which status is just one part? Yes, I, I I agree absolutely, and you know have heard similar things echoed, you know, by the folks that I've interviewed in Puerto Rico during the summer and since. Before Hurricane Maria, there was already a lot of talk about the death of the Commonwealth, with the establishment of the Promesa Law that the Puerto Rico oversight, management, uh, merge. I forget what the acronym is for but because everyone just refers to it as promesa, which is Spanish for promise, right? So the, the, the fact that it had that uh, name was just so symbolically powerful. And so a lot of uh, activists in Puerto Rico, they, they came up with this, with this slogan that said that it was the time of the end of the promises. Uh, their, their slogan was, se acabaron las promesas. So that idea 
idea of the end of the promises, of the promises of, of decolonization, of the false promise of having decolonized Puerto Ricans through the establishment of the ELA, you know, that was seen as the death of the Commonwealth. With, the, I think, Hurricane Maria, the federal response to the storm, Trump's, you know, overt recognition of what, you know, already previous organ, uh, uh, administrations had also, you know, demonstrated, if not as overtly, that Puerto Ricans were not going to be extended statehood, that they were not going to be extended full citizenship rights, full aid in the wake of, of the hurricane. You know, that was weakening then the promise of statehood. And then in this in the summer movement with the pro statehood governor having to step down and his party, you know, revealed as a site of corruption, mismanagement, whose main interest was uh, self, you know, their, their perception and their reelection. I think it became, you know, really clear that this was the end of, you know, these political parties as we know it. The young people that I interviewed during the protest movement, they made it very clear that they are not going to vote the way their parents had voted and that they feel that their parents, in, in a way, they were forced to foreclose their future, you know, and, and set aside questions of governance and set aside questions of the kind of society they want to live in, in for the sake of this promise of a, a change in political status. And so uh, young people feel like their parents were duped and hijacked, right? And, and that, they're, that, that they were, you know, promised this political change and voted for these political parties under the pretext of this political change that has also proven to be a false promise. So I think that without a doubt, there's a crisis in the party system. There's a crisis in the kind of political options. The the, the buffet of shitty options has, has been revealed <laughs> as as what it is. And, and young people are saying that they don't want those options anymore. The problem is that, th that they don't and, and this is not a problem endemic to Puerto Rico, but endemic to post-colonial societies, you know, across the globe, where there is a, a difficulty of thinking beyond these political terms. And so they want something that is outside of those options. They're not sure how to bring it into being. But I think that, you know, in, in the face of kind of having nothing to lose, you know, of, of having a future that only heralded further decay, a closed university closing of public schools, the inability to stay and live and thrive there, young people are in a sense risking it all. You know, they're, they're not afraid to get rid of, of the status quo, to get rid of their governor. And, you know, I don't think we've been able to think enough about how what happened in Puerto Rico is connected to what's happening throughout the world right now, where we're seeing people, you know, uh, in the streets, battling for change, asking their politicians to step down without a clear sense of what will follow, but with a clear sense that it that it just couldn't possibly be worse. So I think that, you know, we're seeing a kind of global trend here, I hope, and, and a kind of wave of protest that is going to be historic in many senses. One thing that's going on right now are Asambleas de Pueblo, or People's Assemblies, which are organizing for a constituent assembly to write a, a new constitution. What are they what are they doing in organizing and do you see them as as able to create like a true counter power to the Puerto Rican state as it exists today? I think it, no, I think it's really interesting that these uh assembleas emerged in the in the very similar fashion to how the entire summer movement emerged, which was decentralized, you know, not uh, spearheaded by one particular organization or figurehead, but, uh, you know, occurring, uh, I hesitate to say spontaneously or organic because I, I, you know, I have problem with those labels, but what might appear to be that matter. And so I think that their popularity show the fact that most Puerto Ricans, that they're, they're not going to turn to the traditional political parties in the wake of the summer. They're not even going to turn to alternative or emerging political parties, but rather to other political forms, community organizations, etc. And so 
I, I attended the first wave of these in Puerto Rico before having to come back to New York to teach for the semester. And I, what I saw was this kind of, even, even as Puerto Ricans had achieved the, gover you know, the governor's resignation, there was this kind of momentum that was still felt and, and this desire to carry on the movement and to not think you know, clearly that his stepping down was the end of it. And so uh, in the assemblies, when people would come together, they would talk way beyond you know what had happened with the governor but but it, and these assemblies became a site in which to articulate all these broad problems that puerto ricans were facing and to also articulate them again in a decentralized manner i went to assemblies in different towns and it was interesting how the concerns of each locality some of them are more concerned about these new 2022 arrivals you know others are more concerned about coastal erosion 2022 being the the ta the acts that created these tax breaks we were talking about earlier. Yes, the the, the tax I call them tax evaders, although you know <laughs> they they tell me that they're just benefiting from you know tax incentives, but uh, their kind of localized concerns vary. For example, in the town of Lares, uh, uh, you know, a big part of the assembly discussion had to do with the cemetery that's been closed since Hurricane Maria. You know, so a lot of these are very localized problems, and and in in, in lots of ways, the this kind of turn to a kind of micro scale organizing response to how people dealt with their society in the wake of Maria, where it was all about micro scale organizing and but that doesn't mean the turn to the micro doesn't mean that there's no possibility of macro action because what we saw in the summer was that all that micro scale organizing and communities and and neighborhood associations etc was what made possible the mass movement against the governor. And so I, I, what, what I think has happened is that people have gone back to the macro, uh, uh, sorry, have gone back to the, yeah, to the micro as the site of, of organizing and thinking and working through perhaps developing a new political vision for Puerto Rico that they don't see emerging out of the political parties. It's unclear what's going to happen here. I know a, lo a lot of folks are invested in perhaps new political candidates emerging out of these assemblies. Uh, last time I was in Puerto Rico, that's you know what, what a lot of you know as I was on radio shows and stuff. A lot of the people in the kind of public sphere are are thinking, but I think that. Part of what the summer showed and what Hurricane Maria showed is that the electoral realm is not the true site of politics in Puerto Rico right now. And so I think that instead of being concerned with putting forth a particular leader or candidate or creating a new political party, what uh, populations in Puerto Rico are concerned with is developing a new political agenda and a new vision for the island. So what, you know, what do they want recovery to look like? What do they want their, their economies to look like? What are the challenges of, you know, tourism and, 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 and overdevelopment in certain places? So to create a kind of series of agenda points that then any politician would be forced to contend with and have to uh, reckon with and speak to. That's what I see uh, happening, as well as maintaining mobilization and popular organizing and the ability to carry out protest on a kind of moment's notice. You know, some people think that Puerto Ricans have gone home and are done protesting, but I've talked to a lot of people who have what what they call their protesta kit. You know, they have their pot and pan to bang on because these cacerolazos became central to the organizing. They have their their handkerchiefs to deal with tear gas and pepper spray and they're 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 mobilized and ready to go back to the streets and i think that they've discovered that it's through small scale community organizing and then large scale demonstrations that we've been able to affect change politically much more so than through the electoral realm one thing that jumped out for me in the book is is how useful puerto rican activists and scholars have found naomi klein's concept of disaster capitalism to be, and incredibly, Junta leader Natalie Juresco was quite explicit about her disaster capitalism approach, saying, quote, the lessons I think I bring to this crisis are to use the moment of crisis, this fiscal crisis, this hurricane crisis, use the political will in the moment to do the most that you can to change the economy, 
in a conversation that you had with with Naomi, she pointed out that this was strikingly similar to what happened after Katrina when Mike Pence, who was then the head of this right-wing caucus of House Republicans, the Republican Study Committee, convened a meeting of right-wing think tanks to devise a wish list of how to exploit the hurricane to push reactionary reforms in New Orleans. But Maria not only created a crisis for the junta to exploit, but it also, it seems, as we've been discussing, created a crisis for the broader system that the junta relies upon to impose its rule. My last question is, does Puerto Rico also then offer a window not in not just into disaster capitalism, but into the contradictions of disaster capitalism and how people might exploit those contradictions to liberatory ends? I think what we saw in the summer was not the contradictions of, of, of disaster capitalism, but the contradictions of disaster. So where on the one hand, you have increased profiteering, you have folks wanting to benefit from the economic opportunities of recovery. But at the same time, you have communities thrown into a, a liminal state, suspension of, of, of their normality, a suspension of public services. You know, this is a kind of cliche to talk about how people rediscover their neighbors and all these things, right, in the context of a, of a disaster. So I think that, that that's, those are the contradictions of a disaster where, you know, you have on the one hand a rush to to benefit, but you also have a rush to, to take care of each other and a rush to build community. And so I think that that's part of what became evident in, in in the, in the summer. But I think the other thing that's important to think about in terms of disaster capitalism and Puerto Rico is, first of all, you know, the kind of colonial logics of disaster capitalist and racial colonial logics of disaster capitalism, how it is disproportionately racialized communities and, and current or former colonies that are the sites of profiteering and of displacement in the wake of a disaster. It will be important to compare Puerto Rico's recovery to, for example, that of Texas after Harvey and what disaster capitalism looked like there and who it impacted. Um, there's certainly, you know, deep similarities with New Orleans. So that's, the, you know, that's something to consider. And the other thing that I've been, you know, writing and thinking about also and that I, I think is represented in the book in the afterword by Nelson Maldonado Torres is how we can think of colonialism itself as a disaster as a, as a form of profiteering, as a form of extraction, as a crisis produced and benefited from. So I think that, you know, using disaster a, a, as a kind of broader conceptual framework for interrogating not just the accelerated economic processes that follow something like a hurricane, an earthquake, or, or even a recession, but, but looking more, his, you know, historically with a kind of a longer view of the kind of forms of slow violence and a, and a crude disaster, which create then, you know, in, in the dialogue with Naomi Klein, I talk about how in many ways the idea of the shock doctrine is, is actually not useful for thinking about Puerto Rico because there was no shock. What, what, what was there was trauma. And what was happening in the wake of the disaster was not some sudden new imposition that people were stunned by, but rather the reproduction of longstanding uh, relations relationships and processes that were all too familiar. So I think, you know, we need to have a kind of more nuanced sense of, of what what the disaster and disaster capitalism represents. Well, Yarimar Bonilla, thank you very much. Thank you. Yarimar Bonilla is a professor in the Department of Africana, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies at Hunter College, and the PhD program in Anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She is also the co-editor with Marisol Lebron of Aftershocks of Disaster, Puerto Rico Before and After the Storm, from Haymarket Books. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after reviewing the idyllic proceedings that are the chief momenta of primitive accumulation, while other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point 
is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Zachary Nin and Julia Rock. Our senior advisor is Thea Rio Francos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. And also leave us a nice review on iTunes or wherever because those reviews ostensibly help put us in touch with new listeners. But what really and truly does that is you telling people you know that you like the show and suggesting that they listen to it. Please make propaganda for us. And do, last but not least, make a contribution at patreon.com to help keep this operation up and running strong. Mm-hmm.